Okay, so uh, we were leaving off, and I started to introduce the Poisson distribution. I'll just reintroduce it today. Um, we'll work through kind of a couple problems related to that discrete random variable. And then if we have a little bit extra time, I'll work on a couple of the practice exam problems that I haven't posted up on YouTube. So yesterday, uh, there should be, we can actually take a look at it. Maybe. Zoom in inside my way. So let's go to YouTube. This is the wrong one. So let's go to. I don't want to do that. Should give me an option to sign out of here. There we go. Just look it up. So we go here, go to playlists, go to our section. I want you guys to hear that. If you look down here, there's questions one through four, questions five through nine, questions 17 through 20. So it's basically me working through those problems on that practice exam A. So the question that we do today will not be these, <laughs> um, just because I've already got kind of how we would work through those. Uh, so I'll start in some different problems. If you have any specific questions on practice exam um, A or B, we, I, you know, I can go over them again if you really want me to, but you can kind of see me work through those here in one of these videos. And I kind of tried to put them into smaller sections. So if you have a specific question, you're not like going through this long video, you kind of can, can choose the one that has that specific question involved in it. Okay. Um, any questions for me before we kind of jump into things today? Leading into the exam or, okay. All right. So we had this set up last class, we were starting to talk about, we had the binomial distribution, but we also have a unique discrete random variable, which is the Poisson, right? So the Poisson isn't capped in the total number of successes we can see, it's just over some interval. Typically this is a time interval, any example I would use on the exam will be a time interval, but we could also see kind of a space interval. So we might see an example today where we're looking at, you know, something occurring over a mile or something occurring over a certain amount of liquid or something. So uh, we had a couple criteria that had to be met. I'm not going to worry too much about going over these again because it's always going to be met in any example that I give you. We're just going to assume that that this is true, that you know, over any given interval of the same length, the probability that we see something occur is going to be the same. Right? And that these intervals kind of don't overlap, right? So the idea was, let's say uh, I'm interested in there's on average, 10 accidents every week out in McGalliard. Right? What's the probability this next week I see seven? Right? That's kind of the, the, the general setup, right? We have an interval, right? a week, it's our time interval. We know the average that typically happens over that time interval. I think I said it was 10, 10 accidents. And now we're interested in predicting what's gonna happen next week, which is what's the probability we see five accidents, seven accidents, more than three accidents, right? So the way that we find the probability of exactly a certain number of occurrences, in our, my example, a certain number of accidents, would be using this probability mass function. So we had a probability mass function for the binomial that told us the probability of seeing a certain number of X successes. Here, this is gonna be what it is for the Poisson. So really it's actually quite a bit easier because there's only two things we have to keep track of. This E is just some natural kind of number. Like I said, you can find this on your calculator. Usually it's second, and I forget what, what button it's above on most calculators, but you can kind of see it there. It just, just looks like a cursive E. Lambda is gonna be the average rate we typically see over that interval, so it has to be given to us, right? So when I think about um, whatever interval I'm looking at, my example was there was 10 accidents, that would be my lambda, right? That's the average we typically see. And then X is just, well, what am I interested in? The number of occurrences I'm interested in finding the probability of. So lambda would be the 10 accidents every week, and X would be I'm interested in finding the probability of five happening this next week. Right? Once I plug that X and lambda in, E is always the same. We said if we want the actual number, it's something like 2.71828. So for whatever reason, if we panic, we can't find it on our calculator because we didn't look ahead of time before the exam, um, this kind of number would work for you if you use it, right? Out to the, what, fifth decimal, okay? So, uh, we'll work through an example here. So let's say, so there's this guy a long time ago, and he, he you know, real smart, whatever, wrote, wrote a really good book. Um, 
he found that on average, there's 0.61 soldiers that die every year from, from cavalry or getting kicked to death by horses in the Prussian cavalry. Right? So on average, over a year, that year is our time interval, we typically see 0.61 soldiers die. Right? So this 0.61 is going to be our lambda. It's the average rate we typically see over that time interval of a year. All right. What's the probability then we could be interested in, what's the probability that exactly three people would be kicked and killed by horses in that army the next year? So now I'm wanting to find the probability x is equal to 3. And so x is going to be 3, lambda, remember this was lambda, this Greek letter here, is 0.61. Now it's just a matter of plugging those into our equation, right? And hopefully this shouldn't be too bad, right? Because we're just taking something to a power here. One thing to got to make sure you always don't forget, because you'll get wildly incorrect answers if you, if you don't put in there, is this is negative, right? e to the negative 0.61, okay? And then we've already dealt with these factorials, right? So um, you kind of can notice what would be a problem potentially with this equation. Oh, sorry, actually, also this should not be repeated. You can kind of cross one of these out. What would be a potential problem with this Poisson distribution? What would happen if I wanted to find the probability of, I don't know, 100 soldiers dying the next year? Well, now my X is 100. This becomes 100 factorial. What's the problem if I try to do that in my calculator? I can't do it, right? But typically these, you know, if we think about this, if on average 0.61 die every year, by the time we get to 100, what should that probability be pretty close to? Yeah, right? If the average is 0.61, the likelihood of seeing 100 the next year, almost impossible, right? So once we start to get those larger numbers, it's not typically a big deal because we already know the probability is so close to zero, we wouldn't even need to compute it. Um, if we go ahead and plug this into our, our calculator, um, we'll get 0 0.02. All right, so I, like I said, this is, it's the same process as the binomial ex examples we were doing, but honestly, I think probably an easier equation, right? This equation is a little bit easier to deal with. Okay? So we're, we'll, we'll work through another couple examples. So let's say, um, here I'll go right there. Oops. let's say uh, I'm in a hospital, I'm interested in staffing decisions, and I know that typically my hospital sees 1.25 births every hour, right? What's the probability that in this next hour I see exactly three? So maybe I'm worried about not having enough people on staff to kind of handle, even though it's not the most common outcome, right? The most common or the average I typically see is 1.25 births every hour. But I'm worried that if I did have three, I might not have enough people on staff. And so I want to know, well, what's the likelihood that I do see three births then? Because if it's a fairly high probability, then I need to make different staffing decisions okay? or how many people are on staff. So we're looking at one hour time intervals. The average we typically see is 1.25. So that's gonna be our Lambda. And then we're interested in finding the probability of exactly three or the probability X is equal to three. So now my X is gonna be three here. Okay? Now, if I look at all these answers, none of them you know, look preposterous and right? they, none of them look too high to, you know, None of them are negative, right? This is a probability, so it has to be between zero and one, right? So I probably can't rule any of these out. However, you know, I wanna remember, I am looking for a probability, so it should be between zero and one. If the average I typically see is 1.25, what should be the two most likely outcomes that I see? Remember, this is a discrete random variable, so I can only ever see zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So what should the two most likely outcomes be if this is my mean or my expected value? One and two, right? If 1.25 is the average, then the most common outcomes I would see would be one or two, right? Just, just like the binomial, when we had that expected value or that mean, if it wasn't an integer, then we knew like the two values on either side of it would be the, the two most likely outcomes. And then as we move away from that mean or away from that kind of average rate, the probabilities start to fall, okay? So I probably can't really like narrow it down here. I just have to go ahead and use that equation. So I've identified lambda, right? that's the average rate we typically see. I've identified X, that's the number of occurrence I'm, occurrences I'm interested in finding the probability of. From there, it's just, it's really is just a matter of kind of plugging this into our equation and kind of being comfortable using our calculator with factorials, finding that E button, okay? Uh, so we'll get about 0.09. Any questions on that? Like I said, it's a very similar process to what we did last class with the binomial, just a slightly different formula. 
So if a probability that I see three births is 0 0.09, what would I know is true about the probability I see five births? It would have to be lower, right? I'm moving further away from that expected value of 1.25, and so I know the likelihood is going to start to fall. Right? Think about it this way. If I typically see 1.25 births every hour, what's the likelihood I see 100? Well, just intuitively, you know, very, very unlikely, right? Because if I, on average, I see 1.25, there's almost no way I'll see 100. Right? I mean, it's just intuitively it doesn't make any sense. So kind of keep that in mind as we're, we're thinking about different probabilities, moving away from that expected value. Okay? So what if... I wanted the probability that I saw what? So it's the same average rate, but I want to know what's the probability I see two or more births every hour. So what am I looking for here? That's usually what I, the first thing I would do is kind of write down what I'm looking for. So what I'm going to do here is just write down, let me get rid of myself here so this doesn't look weird. Maybe. So what I want is the probability of two or more in the next hour. So I want to know what's the probability X is greater than or equal to two, right? Now what's gonna be the problem if I try to solve this? Well, we do it just like the binomial. We would say, okay, what outcomes would fit this criteria? We then find the probability of each one of those outcomes, add them all up. Right? So what's the first thing that would fit this criteria? X could be equal to two. Then I would add to that the probability x is equal to 3 plus the probability x is equal to 4. Where do I stop? We don't have a cap here, right? This is a Poisson example. And so, I mean, theoretically, it just kind of continues on to infinity. I guess here we could say right, it's capped off at the number of, of women in that, you know, in a certain age group in that county or wherever that, that hospital is. But it's going to be a really, really large number, and we don't want to go all the way up. So, just like with a binomial, but even more so, it probably helps if we think about this as, let's see if I need this blank up here. No, I can't. If this is event A, what's another way I could solve for this? One minus the probability of A complement. What would A complement be here? Yeah, just X being less than two. Okay. What outcomes fit this criteria? Well, x, the first value it could be is what? One, because I don't have the equality here and it's discrete, the very first outcome I could see would actually be one. And then the other outcome I could see would be x is equal to zero. So I'm gonna have to use that Poisson equation two times, once where x is equal to one, so compute that, write that number down, once where x is equal to zero, Get that into my calculator, write that number down. I'll add those two up and subtract them from one. Right? So you can see here with the binomial, yeah, we had a lot more work. Maybe sometimes when we wanted to find the probability of A, but with the Poisson, we literally have to use that complement rule sometimes in order to be able to find the probability that we want. Because where do we stop? Right? We just kind of go on to infinity. Yeah. So remember, the probability of A plus the probability of A complement, right? If I think about it this way, all the outcomes that are greater than or equal to two, plus all the outcomes that are less than two, that covers every single possible outcome. So I know those probabilities will add up to one. One is the entire experimental, uh, uh, experimental outcome space. And so if I know that the probability of A complement and the probability of A add up to one, I can rearrange that equation a little bit so that the probability of A is equal to one minus the probability of the complement. So the question there was, why do we subtract it from one? So does that answer? All right, any questions on that? Let me make sure that I don't have anything sitting in the chat here, okay. So we have a little bit of work to do, but at least we kind of know where to start. Um, so we can rewrite this using that complement rule. And then from there, it's really just a matter of using that Poisson equation once where X is equal to zero, find that probability. And then once where x is equal to one, we'll find that probability, add those two up and subtract them from one. Right? Once, we, once we have those, we'll just plug them into what we did up here in the board. Okay? Now, a couple things to point out. What is anything to the zero power? Just one. So really this is 
can almost be ignored. It's just 1.25 to the zero will be one. What was zero factorial? Just one, so we really don't have to divide by anything here. One factorial is one. So, the, you know, when, I'm dealing, when you're dealing with these, these low probabilities are a little bit easier to find because things just start to kind of drop out because they're just equal to one. Um, and this kind of makes sense, right? If 1.25 was, excuse me, if 1.25 was the average rate we typically see, one and two should be pretty likely. So one here is very likely, right? 35% chance we see one birth. I don't know what the probability we see two is. We could kind of compute that. Um, my guess is it's probably somewhere around 0.3, right? And then as we kind of move further away, things just become a lot less likely. Any questions on, on this before we keep moving? You're okay with this? So, uh, I'll show you this picture. I, I don't necessarily know, you know, it kind of gives us a nice little idea, but as I move to Passans with higher and higher lambdas or higher and higher average rates, right? We can kind of see this starts to just look, you know, it's always right skewed. The Poisson distribution is always right skewed. And it kind of makes sense, right? We can't, can't see anything below zero. So it's always gonna be censored on that left-hand side. But as we get a higher and higher lambda or a higher and higher mean, it just kind of starts to shift where we're getting closer and closer to something that looks maybe a little bit normal. But ultimately, right, it's still gonna be a right skewed distribution. Because there'll always be like a longer right tail than we would see kind of a, a left tail. Okay, and I'll use this for something else here in just a second. Uh, one thing that's kind of unique about the Poisson, and we won't have to waste a lot of time on this, um, we could Google mathematical proof, but it's, you know, not necessarily something I expect you to know or, or overly interesting probably to you. But a really unique property of the Poisson is that the mean, well, the mean is just the average rate we typically see. That kind of makes sense. So the mean is just lambda, right? It's that expected value or what we typically see or the mean. Right? The variance actually ends up also being equal to lambda. Right, so it's kind of a unique property of the Poisson distribution that the mean and the variance are both lambda. Okay. And then of course I wanted the standard deviation, just like always, just the square root of the variance. So if the variance is lambda, the standard deviation would just be the square root of lambda. Okay. So I don't think that anything terribly tough here. If I ask you a question on the exam, um, which I may ask you this question since I've already have the exam written. Um, if I ask you for the mean or the variance of a Poisson distribution, you have to be given lambda in the problem. This should be very easy points, <laughs> right? Whatever your, the average rate you're told is, that's the mean and the variance, okay? All right, so um, let's go back to a, the binomial for a second. I wanna try to relate these. And I, I probably want you ex expect you to do this particular problem on the exam, but it kind of helps us work through a binomial on another Poisson example, just so we get, get more, get used to using these equations. So let's say we had a mass that contained 10,000 atoms, right, of some radioactive substance. The probability that any one atom decays, or sorry, the probability that an atom decays over the next minute is 0 0.0005, so pretty low. What's the probability out of these 10,000, we see exactly three atoms decay in the next minute? Well, we have this set up as a binomial because we either see an atom decay or we don't. All right, so one, zero, success, failure. The probability that any one atom decays is 0 0.0005. And as long as you know, these are independent decays, which we'll assume they are, then the probability of success, or the probability we see any one atom decay, decay is the same across all atoms. Our n, the number, total number we could see decay is 10,000. And we're interested in finding the probability of x, which is exactly three. So we could set this up as a binomial, plug all of our numbers in. And you know, it's nice here, if we think about um, this definitely, we can't put 10,000 factorial into a calculator, right? But if we wrote this out, remember 10,000 times 9,999, once we got to 9,997, everything would cancel. So we could do this problem, but what if we were interested in maybe seeing what's the probability that 100 atoms decay or something like that? Well, we're still gonna have, you know, then we don't have near as much canceling out. We're still gonna have a number that we probably can't deal with in our calculator. And so, you know, this is also, you know, like I said, I think the Poisson distribution is an easier equation to deal with. So it actually ends up being true. So we, we could compute this. 
But what actually ends up being true is that if we have a really, really large number of trials, so n's really big, and the probability of success is really, really, really small, the binomial distribution actually ends up being approximated by a Poisson distribution very, very closely. So if I remember that the equation for the binomial mean is just n times p, right? So up here I say, okay, I'll take 10,000 times the probability of success of 0 0.005, multiply those two together. That gives me my mean for the binomial. I'll just treat that as that's the mean of a Poisson and I can get a really close approximation now by using that mean as, of, you know, treating that, that mean I found as lambda and using the Poisson equation. So if I use this and plug in for lambda 10,000 times 0 0.0005, and then I'm interested in finding the probability that three atoms decay, so X is three, right? So just plug those values in. So 10,000 times 0 0.0005 is five. So that's my lambda. My uh, X is three. I compute this, I actually end up getting the exact same answer, at least out to the fifth decimal. I'm sure if we go out to some decimal, right, it's an approximation, it's gonna be off way out at some far decimal, but at least to the, to the fifth decimal here even, we can get the exact same answer. We kind of have a nice visual of this, and here even the, uh, the mean, you know, it's not that we even necessarily have a high number of trials. So if we look here and we have a Poisson that has a mean of 0.1, Actually, let's do the 0.5 one. I think this one's a little better. So if we had a Poisson distribution that had a mean of 0.5, notice the probability of zero is about 0.6 and then it kind of falls off pretty quickly. If I go all the way back up here, when we were talking about the binomial, so I find a distribution that has a mean of 0.5. Well, if N is five and P is 0.1, n times p, the mean here of a binomial is 0.5. Notice the probability of zero is 0.6 and it falls off very quickly. Now, this one probably wouldn't be a good one to use because n is, is pretty small here, but we can see even when n is small, this binomial and the Poisson distribution look pretty similar when that probability of success is relatively low. And so if that probability of success gets even lower and n gets even higher, these two things just become even closer of an approximation for each other, okay? All right, let's go back. So we could do that, like I said, on the exam, I'm not gonna expect you to convert um, a binomial to a Poisson, but it gave us a little bit more kind of practice of, of seeing how we would plug some of these values in. Okay. So which of the following um, scenarios would be good to use the Poisson? So really what we're looking for is an interval right, of time, and we wanna be looking for the number of successes that it could occur over that interval. Well. I've already used this example uh, in class today, but the probability we see a certain number of accidents on a highway over an entire day. If I have the average rate I typically see on that road on a typical, you know, on a typical day, that's my lambda. That's really all I need. All I need to use the Poisson is that average rate and be looking at some, some interval. And like I said, for us, usually a time interval. Okay. The probability that a stock exceeds 10% in a given year. Well, here, I'm, I'm, I could be confused because I've got a year, right? I've got the time interval, but what would my average kind of rate be? So here I'm looking, does the stock return exceed 10%? You know, so it could be, you know, it's not like I'm looking for the number of times it exceeds 10%. It can either exceed it or it doesn't. It's either, you know, some value above 10 or it's below it. I can't really find a number of occurrences here, right? I'm looking at one stock. If I had an example that I said, how many stocks in the portfolio exceed 10% and the probability any one stock exceeded 10%, you know, we think it might be the same over that year. Even then, well, I'm looking for, does it exceed or not? It's not how many of them occur, you know, it's not how many times each one of these occurs over a given interval. I'm really thinking about more of a binomial here, even if I try to change this example, okay? So that's gonna be the one that we really can't treat as a Poisson, but just to get a couple more examples that you could see. The probability we see a certain number of calls come to a call center over a given minute. If I know the average number I typically see over a minute, I'll have lambda. This is a very good example. You know, the probability a certain number of insurance claims are made over the next, what, month, year, week, doesn't, doesn't matter what period of time. That'd be another great example. And you can kind of imagine these are things companies probably want to know. If I know that I typically see this many calls come in, or I typically see this many insurance claims, well, I want to make sure I have enough people 
to handle those calls. So if the probability of seeing a few more than the average is relatively high, I want to make sure I have people on, on hand. If you know, I know that I, you know, the probability of seeing a, a number of insurance claims is uh, relatively high for numbers that are greater than the average rate. Well, I want, might want to make sure that I, I have the, uh, the funds or I have the ability to kind of handle all those claims. Right? So these are, you know, the Poisson is a pretty relevant, you know, it's, it's very applicable to a lot of different scenarios. Um, and that's why, why, why I'm going over it. Um, so we'll go through one more example um, with the Poisson distribution, and then I'll do some work on the board. I think this is probably the last kind of stuff I have in the slides here. So there's this guy, W.S. Gassette. You know, he was hired as, as a brewer by Guinness. He had no formal education in statistics, mathematics, um, no degrees. And what, what he ended up finding out is what was, he was working as a brewer. He had to kind of test, right? You see, like, if you've ever been to a brewery, they have these huge, like, I don't know what they call them. I call them bats. But they're like, they look like these silos where they're brewing this beer. They obviously can't test the entire thing, but they can sample a little bit of the liquid from it to make sure that it's brewing the way they want. Um, and typically, like, you know, the way I'm going to describe this, I don't know if this is like the technical way that brewers do it, but one thing they might want to test is the amount of yeast per, per particle, right? Because they want to make sure that it's at whatever level they want. And so he discovers that as he's testing, right, this, this smaller amounts of this huge vat of liquid, that the number of particles he's seeing follows a, what he, you know, kind of, kind of uh, ends up identifying as a Poisson distribution. He also came up with a bunch of other stuff that we'll talk about later in this course. Um, but because he didn't have any formal training, because he didn't have a degree, some of the distributions, he actually came up with this family of distributions, don't carry his name. They're actually just called student distributions. Right? So if you've ever heard of the normal distribution, that's kind of like the bell curve. That's actually also called the Gaussian because a guy named you know, Gauss came up well. They didn't name it the Gassette distribution. Right? So there's a little bit of history and he made a bunch of money. So, um, let's say we have this example where he's testing one milliliter of liquid from this huge vat, all right? So this is kind of a weird one because now we're not dealing with a time interval, but we're dealing with a liquid kind of space, right? One milliliter. We can, we can do that. Just like I could say how, you know, if I'm walking down the road, what's the probability I see 10 pieces of trash over this next hundred yards, right? I could, don't have to do a time interval. I can do like a space interval. So each milliliter that he draws out, um, he typically sees that on average, there's 10 particles, 10 yeast particles per milliliter, right? So he then says, okay, if I were to test one more, what's the probability in that one I only see eight? Because even though the average is 10, I might take the first sample, the first milliliter might only have nine, and the next one might have nine, the next one might have 10, the next one might have 12, the next one might have 11, right? I'm not always gonna see 10, that's just the average. And so what's the probability that I see eight, right? Well, if on average over this space, I see 10 particles, that's my lambda. I'm interested in finding the probability that in this next sample, I see exactly eight, that'll be my X. That's all I need for the Poisson, right? Once I have lambda, once I have X, just plug them in, I'll get it. Now, if I look at these answers, which one of these could I probably rule out as being the correct answer? Takes a little bit of thought, but there's one here that I actually can, I can technically rule it out for sure. C, right? So it looks a little bit different, right? It's pretty high, but why can I theoretically rule it out? Well, if we think about this, the mean should be the most likely outcome. Said differently, that, that you know, if I was look, to look up the probability that I see exactly 10, right, the average, that should be the highest probability. If the probability that I see eight is 0.8, well, there's only point, what, one seven of probability left to get me to the entire experiment outcome space. So if the probability of eight was 0.8, the probability of 10 couldn't be higher than that. And I know that the probability I would see exactly 10 has to be the highest because it's the expected value or the mean, right? And then as I move further away from 10, the probabilities have to start to fall. So at the very least, I know that this probability would, should be less than 0.5 because it's not the most likely outcome, right? And if it, the probability is greater than 0.5, then it, there's no way any other outcome could be more likely. Right? Other than that, I really can't rule anything out, but we can kind of cross out C here. We know one of these will be the, the correct answer. We identified lambda and X, we kind of already mentioned this. Now it's just a matter of plugging and chugging. Get it, because Guinness beer. Um, okay, so anyways, 
So we plug in lambda is 10, we plug in x is 8, right? It's pretty easy. Right? I mean, I shouldn't say it's easy, but it's the same process that we've been doing with all these other problems. Once we identify those two pieces of information, we know what equation we need to use, same process over and over, okay? All right, so we get about 0.1126 there if we enter this into our calculator. And then another terrible joke, but I always like this mean. If you heard the joke about the Poisson distribution, it's pretty fishy because Poisson means fish in French, I think. Does anyone know French? Okay. I always forget if it's, it's French or not. All right. I don't think we'll work through this because I want to get through some uh, other stuff and also maybe some practice exam problems. But I do want to do one more thing with the Poisson that you could see wink, wink on the exam. Let's say that I'm told, uh, oh, it's a fun example. I don't know. Um, the number of people, I always use like shark attacks and lightning, but we'll do, we'll do lightning. Um, let's say that on average, over a given year, right? That something like, I think I will do, make this easy. Let's say 36 people are struck by lightning every year, okay? Well, from here, it'd be very easy to think about with a Poisson distribution. I could start to find things like, well, what's the probability that 30 people are struck this year, right? Because I'd have my lambda, I'd have my X, pretty easy. But what if I was interested in the probability that X, and now I say, what's the probability that, um, two people are struck by lightning this month, right? So I've changed the time interval. But as long as I'm told that being struck by lightning is equally as likely every month, right? There's, and I'm not sure if that's scientifically true, but let's assume for a second it is. I have the average that typically I see over a year. So I can't use this to find the probability that I see to this next month, but I can convert this, right? to find the average, if I know the average I see over a year is 36, how can I find the average that I typically see over a month? Just divide it by 12, there's 12 months in a year. So now I have the average over the month, which is three. Um, I have the X that I'm interested in for that month, which is two. Now it's just back to a normal example, right? I've got lambda is three, x is two, plug those in, I could get the probability. So we can do some conversions, right? I might originally be given an average over a longer time interval. If I wanna to go to a shorter time interval, like from a year to a month, I'll just be dividing by whatever that conversion factor is. And if I ask you a question like this in the exam, it's not gonna be anything like uh, converting, I don't know, miles to yards or anything like that that you might not remember off the top of your head, but it'll be something very easy, year to months, uh, days to hours. So if I was going from one day to, to an hour, I would just divide by 24. Hour to minutes, divide by 60. Kind of those, those types of examples. Maybe week to day, divide by seven, something like that. Right? Um, any questions on, on this? I didn't kind of complete the example, but you, you can see once I have the lambda and I've got x, it's just like the other examples that we worked through. I'm sure there's no questions there. All right. We're good with this. What if I wanted to go? So if we want to go to a smaller time interval, we were dividing by a conversion factor. Let's say I know the number of car accidents I typically see every day is four, but then I'm interested in finding the probability that, I don't know, 20 happen this next week. How can I convert my lambda here so that I get the lambda or the average rate over the next week? I would simply do what? I know the average every day is four. Yeah, the average over the week would just be, well, there's seven days in a week, so now I'm multiplying by whatever that conversion factor is. So if I wanna to go to a longer time interval, I should be multiplying by by that, whatever converts it. If I wanted to go to a smaller time interval, I was dividing by, okay? So we can work in either direction then. Right. Any 
questions on that. And then once I'm here, right, I've got what? Um, 28 would be my lambda, 20 is my x, plug them in, figure out the probability is. We're okay with these? Okay. So that should cover it for the Poisson for today. I want to, okay, there we go. I want to work through a couple of these problems on practice exam A. So, I think, you know, if I'm studying for the exam, um, another video that might be useful is that additional video I put out, what was it, last weekend, um, on additional Bayes theorem problems, just because, you know, it gives you, you know, I worked through two more examples there. Also, wink, wink, I think it'd be a really good video to watch, okay? Like, really good, like, as you're studying, um, just to see those problems work through, okay? So that's the additional video I posted. It says, like, I think it's called uh, additional video Bayes theorem. Here, I'll show you. Additional Bayes recording, all right? This has, like, I think I worked through two problems, all right? But it has, uh, I would specifically pay attention to those examples that are, I worked through, okay? So here's one that is gonna be similar to a Bayes theorem problem you could be asked about. Um, suppose that given someone is lying, the probability a lie detector test says they're lying is 90%. However, given that the individual is not lying, it incorrectly determines they're lying 20% of the time. Recent studies find on average, people lie about 5% of all things they say. We choose a person at random, answer the following question. So, excuse me, what's the probability that a person is lying and the test says they're telling the truth? Okay. So, well, what do I do here? Uh, let me keep this screen up here. I'll just make this as big as I can and for the recording. So one, the first thing we were told was, well, one easy thing is the probability that someone is lying about something is 5% or, or sorry, the probability would be um, that you're lying. No, that's not, yeah, that's probably right. I always mess this up. I always want to put Y, I, and G, is that right? Yeah. Shows how terrible I am in English. Okay. This is right or this is wrong? That's what I thought. Okay. But every time I write it this way, it doesn't look right either. So, the probability that you're lying is, is 5%, right? So, 0 0.05. So, what would be the probability that, and actually here, I'll write in truth instead of not lying. But probably I lie about things is 5%. The probability that I'm not lying would be. 95% or yeah, 0.95, right? Those are my two states of nature. I know those probably have to add up to one, okay? And I'll switch to full screen here in a second uh, for this video, but let's identify the other things we we're given. So given someone is lying, the probability the lie detector says they're lying is 90%. So remember, given that someone's lying, the probability the lie detector test says they're lying, and I'm going to write LD for like lie detector test here, is 90% or 0.9, right? The next thing we're told is given that someone is not lying, the lie detector test incorrectly determines they are lying 20% of the time. So now we're saying given that someone is telling the truth, the lie detector test actually incorrectly says they're lying 20% of the time or a probability of 0.2. So these were all the things that we were given just from the problem, right? So we'll write these down. Um, I then have to identify, okay, what am I looking for? All right? So I go back, very first question, what's the probability someone is lying and the test says they're telling the truth? All right? So I'm gonna write that down. What's the probability that a person is lying and the lie detector says they're telling the truth. So hopefully we can remember these. I'm going to erase these for a second. What I'm looking for is the probability that uh, someone is lying and the lie detector actually says they're telling the truth. Right? Let me double check this. That's exactly what this was saying. Lying and telling. Okay. 
There we go. So how can I find this intersection? I wasn't given that, right? But if I go to, oh, where is this? There we go. If I go to that formula sheet that we're gonna have that I would suggest kind of having pulled up as you're working through the exam, we look here. Oh, I can rewrite the intersection of two events as a conditional probability times what I'm conditioning on. So here I can write out my example as a conditional probability times what I'm conditioning on. So go back here, I'm gonna say, okay, if this is my A and this is my B, I can write this as, what's the probability that the lie detector test says they're telling the truth, right? Given their line, Get just, I'm just taking what I had in that formula sheet. I'm plugging in my B, and my A, and then I multiply that by the probability of A or whatever I'm conditioning on. Right? What I'm conditioning on, just to make clear, is it's on the right hand side of that vertical line. Okay? So I've just rewritten that. Now I, I see here, well, what was the probability that someone was lying about something? I erased it, but that was simply what, 0.05? And then this conditional probability was something that we were given. Well, not quite, right? Here I've got given that someone is lying, the probability that the lie detector test says they're lying is 0.9. So given that they're lying, what should be the probability the lie detector test says they're telling the truth? Yeah, we're conditioning on the same state of nature. There's only two outcomes that we could see. We're ruling out an inconclusive outcome here. And so this wouldn't be 0.9, but 0.1. And we could have ahead of time, if you if you like to, you could have kind of done that probability tree, and that would have been one of the things that you could, could fill in that you weren't directly given. But because you know this conditional probability, if I condition on the same thing, same state of nature, the probability of the other outcome would have to kind of get me back up to one, right? So if this conditional probability is 0.9, the probability of the other outcome, conditioning on the same state of nature, is just whatever gets me up to, to one, right? So 0.1 there, okay? Yeah. Are you going to put a problem on the test that we have to like sort through like that, like through a story? Yeah, so this, right, uh, where is it? Yeah, I would expect to see a problem that looks like this, right? Where you're going to have to identify two conditional probabilities, right? We're given information, we have to identify two conditional probabilities. And I, I'll keep this same language of using that word given Right? And whenever I say given, that's what I'm conditioning on. Right? I'll get, then give you the probability of the, one of the states of nature. Right? And then you can kind of work, you know, work through something similar to this. Right? We're going to probably run out of time here, but you're also then going to be asked one, um, like in 12, where you're going to then have to use Bayes' theorem. Right? So this one, we just simply use the multiplication rule, right? that we could rewrite the intersection as a conditional probability times that we condition on. It gets a little bit harder once we want to find a conditional probability, right? So I'll start to kind of work through this. I'll have to erase kind of what we have here. So is everyone okay with, with this? Okay, um, so number 12 says what? Given that someone fails the lie detector test or uh, given that, oh no, yeah, yeah. given the detector um, determines they lied, what's the probability that they're actually telling the truth, right? So we're going to write this out, what we're looking for. So the probability that I'm interested in is given that the lie detector test says they're lying. That was what we were told. What's the probability they're actually telling the truth? So this is the idea of here's our outcome of the test. We want to know, given that we see that, there's people that lie detector test says they're lying and they actually are, but there's also people that lie detector test says they're lying and they're actually telling the truth. So once I see this result come back from my lie detector, what's the probability the person was actually telling the truth, right? So I go to my formula sheet. Now, if I, oh, didn't want to do that. If I try to simply use my multiplication rule here and I write this out as the intersection of 
of uh, these two events divided by what I'm conditioning on. Well, I'll be dividing by the probability the lie detector says someone's lying. I don't have that, right? And so this is gonna be one where even if I try to write this out, I'm not gonna have those probabilities. I'm looking for a conditional probability and the format of these exams was pretty similar. So you'll probably be able to identify like you're, you're kind of at the question where this might be what you need to use. It's probably a good indicator that in order to find that conditional probability, I'm actually gonna to have to use Bayes' theorem, right? Well, once I have my example, right, I've written out the probability of what I'm looking for. This is my S, this is my E, right? I'm then just gonna write out this formula in the context of my example, right? So the probability of S would be the probability someone is telling the truth times the probability of E given S, the probability that the lie detector test says they're lying, given they're telling the truth, right? So if I just start writing this out in the context of my example, probability that someone's telling the truth times the probability of E, and I'm just following the formula that's on that formula sheet and plugging in the words that fit my example, right? I'll then divide that by, and if we notice on that formula sheet, oh, this up here. We notice on that formula sheet, the first part of that denominator is the exact same as the numerator. So that makes our life a little bit easier. Uh, so probability of truth times the exact same thing we have on top. So given the truth plus the probability of S complement. Well, here if S is telling the truth, S complement would just be probability someone is lying. Right? And then I ran out of room here. Um, multiply by the probability of um, E given S complement, well, or E is a lie detector says they're lying, given S complement, which is, we just said that they're actually lying. So if you can't read this here, this is the probability someone is lying times the probability that the lie detector test says they're lying given that they are lying. Right? So um, we just wrote that out, that formula out in the context of our example. We're getting time, we're almost out. So from here, it's a matter of plugging values in. When I had those original things written down that the problem gave us, those were the conditional probabilities that the problem gave me I have the probability someone's lying was like 5%. We said the probability someone's telling the truth is 95. I have all these values. Now it's just a matter of plugging them into that formula. Okay. All right. I'll, um, like I said, if you want some additional kind of problems that look like this, I would watch that additional Bayes recording. Um, I may get up another couple. Um, I'll probably put up this one as well, what we did in class today. And then Monday, we'll be doing a little bit more review. Monday, try to look at the practice exams. If you have specific questions on either practice exam, A or B, bring those questions Monday, whether or not you're here in person or on Zoom, and I'll answer those specifically. So I'm not working through questions like calculating a mean, right? I hopefully, those, that's not gonna be one you guys have a question on. So um, if you have any questions over the weekend, email me. I'll try to, uh, I'll be a little busy on, on Saturday. But I'll try to respond as, as quick as I can, okay? All right, I'll see you guys on Monday.